Great, thank you everyone. Welcome to our panel on how to mobilize political elites and citizens. Today we have with us Alice Evans, who is a BSc associate and also a lecturer at King's College London. We have Lily Sai, who is a professor of political science at MIT and the director, faculty director of the MIT Governance Lab. And we have Rakesh Rajani, who is the vice president of programs at CoImpact, formerly at the Ford Foundation and then formed 12 Ways, as some of you know him from there, and Haki Alimu is from where I know him from. Um, and we're really excited to have these panelists and to hear what they have to say. I wanted to just give you a brief uh, understanding of what it is that we were looking for in this panel. Um, we know that there's a lot of agendas out there that are really important, whether they may be at a global level, at a regional level, at a local level, that sometimes don't get on the agenda. And sometimes, even when they do get on the agenda, nothing really happens. And so what we wanted to do is, how do we understand, how do we mobilize citizens? How do we mobilize political elites to actually get these agendas on and things and they actually get implemented and things actually happen. So what we did is we've given the panelists a series of questions to answer. Um, and they're basically, how does one think about mobilizing the attention for policies that should be on the agenda and those that are not on the agenda? I wanted them to share from their own experiences examples of what they've tried, what they've learned, how they may have done this in the past, what types of capabilities need to be built, and whose capability do we need to build? And then finally, we are at the Kennedy School. What kind of capabilities do we need to instill in students here so that they are able to get these agenda items onto policy agendas and not just be on an agenda, but something actually happens, right, to get things done? So I wanted to start first with Alice. Um, do you want to share from your experience? So I think one example of some kind of change that's really hard to mobilize is if it's concern for distant others, so not people's everyday priorities, two, if you perceive there as being strong, coordinated opposition, and three, if there's widespread despondency, if people think it's doomed to failure. And uh, an example of that that I've been studying recently is corporate accountability in the UK, Europe, and wider USA. So this is concern for labor rights abuses in global supply chains, you know, distant others in Bangladesh or Vietnam, where there's strong business opposition, you know, in any country it will be tremendously hard to introduce legislation increasing liabilities on our companies because they would immediately cry to say, if you make things harder for us, we'll become less internationally competitive, so we'll go elsewhere. So there will always be strong business opposition. Three is if we never see that kind of change happening, NGOs might think it's not possible. So instead of investing in that kind of activism, they opt for a second best scenario. So work with companies to improve CSR, even though we know CSR does very little to abate problems like Rana Plaza. So I'd say one of the hardest problems would be trying to get corporate accountability for those reasons. Mm -hmm. OK, did you want to answer all the questions? Oh, yes, 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 OK, OK. But, but here's, the, here's the exciting thing. <laughs> Go, oh, Alice. <laughs> As of 2018, all large French companies are now legally obliged to identify and reduce risks of human rights abuses in their supply chains. And if they fail to do this, and if abuse happens, then they'll be taken to court and they can be sued. And the exact sim uh, similarly in Switzerland, this year in July, the National Council voted in support for similar legislation. We've now seen new campaigns opening up in Finland, in Denmark, Canada. They've just been, uh, the International Development Committee has just had a parliamentary motion calling for similar legislation. So why did this happen? How did we mm -hmm. come to mobilize people for change despite these huge obstacles? One is journalists publicizing crises, eroding the legitimacy of the status quo, getting people concerned that our companies were perpetuating these harms, that CSR just isn't working. So one, the journalists. <coughs> Two is providing credible reasons for hope by showing that corporate accountability is the direction of travel. So in both France and Switzerland, they pointed to various examples and ways in which this was happening. So they pointed to Dodd-Frank, where there's a clause about conflict minerals. They pointed to some aspects of the Canadian legislation. The French campaign, the French legislation, has emboldened activists in Switzerland. So people seeing that it's possible, that it's credible, and getting companies to think that this is the way that we're going. 
So providing credible reasons for hope, for showing that this was the international agenda. And incredibly importantly, here at the Kennedy School, John Ruggie played a phenomenally important part of this. So John Ruggie was part of the UN Global Norms, where they were introducing this voluntary idea of due diligence. So they were setting up the idea that it was a voluntary mechanism, just advising and encouraging companies to identify and reduce risks of human rights abuses. That wasn't mandatory. But this, by making it voluntary, it was not threatening. Everyone got on board with it. Everyone came to understand. And it was a very participatory, inclusive meetings. And so by it being this sort of non-threatening, consultative, inclusive process, more companies and governments engage with this idea of due diligence. Then the French campaigners strategically use that idea which had widespread support and said, right, let's turn this into legislation. But to do that, what they needed is a broad coalition. So they worked with a broad range of environmental activists, with development NGOs, with Catholic churches. They got a whole group of legal activists through legal minds you know, to work through the legislation, consumer groups. They got all these brilliant people together, tapped into their networks. And the same is true in Switzerland. So the Swiss campaign is the largest civil society campaign ever. And they've managed to do it by having like over 120 NGOs all collectively working. And what they do in Switzerland is they are careful not to portray it or present it as a niche left-wing environmental campaign. They purposefully <laughs> amplify right-wing support. So there are some right-wing groups or there are religious groups or there are business groups. They say, we've got 100 businesses on board. Now, most of these are actually vegan ice cream companies. <laughs> True story. <laughs> but, but the point is, we've got these businesses on board, right? And so you make it seem like it's a broad, you know, socially inclusive agenda. So the broad coalition, publicizing reasons for hope, you know, tackling that despondency. Because showing it's the international direction of travel does two things. One is it raises aspirations. You know, it raises our expectations. So people come to, we, we only invest in things if we believe that it's possible. If we think it's doomed to failure, we're not going to do it. We're not going to even try. And that despondency, you know, creates the negative feedback loop. But once we think it's possible, then governments and politicians become less worried about undermining their company's competitive advantage, because they no longer think that companies will go elsewhere, because other countries are likely to have similar legislation. So those three things were important. Um, so what we need to do then, for me, it's partly about shifting expectations, providing credible reasons for hope, for getting us to think that we can achieve these things by highlighting examples of successful mobilization and responsive governance. Now, what can we do? What can students do? What, how can we teach, support our students to go into the world and mobilize change? Mm -hmm. Right, OK. So, I'm sure you're doing some of these things already. If it was me, I, and it is me, right, as a lecturer in my own, what I think is three things. One, encourage and support my students so they are equipped, capable, and ready to work with diverse groups. You know, that was really key in the Swiss campaign and also the French campaign, working from all with, with academics, with, with lawyers, with environmental activists, recognizing that we grow, gain strength through the diversity, tapping into different, so being ready for that. Two, being skilled in mass communications. Like the other day with my students, we were writing blogs, you know, mass communications, that's key. Um, and, and I think learning through the sort of success of comparative social movements, learning why some process of mobilization are more successful than others. Great, thank you. Lily? <laughs> <laughs> I, I strongly recommend you go through catch first. I'm like only a hundredth of as animated. As a <laughs> People need balance. People need balance. Uh, balance. Really? Okay. balance is good. Balance is good. Um, so like taking it down a huge notch <laughs> in energy. Um, I guess I wanted to start, I mean, actually, I'm going to pick up on a lot of the points that Alice has just raised and Alice raised this morning in terms of, um, and, and specifically this, like, uh, um, this idea of um, starting with feeling like you're doomed to fail. So I guess one thing that I know as a political scientist is that mobilizing um, attention from citizens and elites for that matter, but mobilizing attention is different from mobilizing action. Um, and we know that um, you can get citizens to increase the salience of an issue for them, like to care more about a policy. You can get politicians to run on policy platforms so it's more about substance rather than anything else, but nevertheless, Issue salience is not the main factor, not a main predictor in whether or not citizens take action. 
um, things like party identification are much more important. Or, you know, as my colleague Danny Hidalgo, who studies Brazil, points out, there are in the developing world um, different equivalents to party ID. So in Brazil, it's loyalty to a political family. Um, so those things are way more important for determining action. Um, so I just want to, you know, underscore that ordinary people increase attention um, to these issues that we care about, but they don't necessarily take action. And so why? And so here, again, picking up on some of the things that have been already um, raised by Alice, I would argue that too often we try to mobilize the action of citizens without mobilizing the actions of elites. Um, and so I would argue that both in terms of my own work and um, the existing research um, out there, that it's really, it is perhaps really important to mobilize elites first. Number one, because I've started to become really uncomfortable with how external actors seek to mobilize the actions of citizens without without knowing or being, you know, having a degree of confidence that elites will respond. Um, so I think I actually would, would put it forward that it can be somewhat unethical to mobilize the actions mm. of ordinary citizens mm. to advocate mm. for these issues mm -hmm. when you don't know or you don't have a pretty mm. good idea that elites will also mm. take action and mm. respond. Mm. Um, but second, also because if you don't mobilize elite action first or you don't have that lined up, mm -hmm. um, citizens are just going to stop taking action because yeah. um, um, what's, you know, the research, research shows that that Instead, when you don't get elite response to citizen action, you get disillusionment, disenchantment, and exit. And moreover, it's highly informed disillusionment. So it's, um, they, they like, uh, they're very, very disillusioned uh, because they know, they've like experienced it firsthand, <laughs> like the disappointment. Um, so um, you know, I think that we can all come up with examples of this. Um, I've recently thought a lot about and written about um, the anti-corruption campaigns that have happened um, after the fall of communism. Um, so, you know, those of you who remember that, um, there was a rise of international anti-corruption advocacy campaigns. And, um, you know, I think it is, it's very easy to make the case that they might have done more harm than good. Um, they changed, they did, they did politicize the issue of corruption, um, and they put anti-corruption on the agenda and good governance on the agenda. But because the, um, EU, for example, in Eastern Europe, the EU required um, Eastern European countries to set up anti-corruption institutions um, as a condition for accession to the EU. Um, there was this external pressure. Um, these institutions were set up, but, but what, what, what didn't happen is that external actors did not make sure that the elites were going to enforce. Um, and so without enforcement, what happened was politics was... Um, is that a question? <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. Just want, do you, yeah, just want to give the opportunity to like, so um, so what happened was politics got, um, it became all about corruption and anti-corruption and political parties were able to use um, anti-corruption as a, an, a key issue to accuse the other side. So, you know, in the case of Romania, for example, opposition parties banded together to accuse the president of corruption. They started impeachment proceedings. Um, you know, there are high profile investigations on both sides there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no prosecution, right? And so, as a result, citizens in Romania are like, this is just something that the politicians use to, you know, accuse each other. And and politics continues to be about corruption and anti-corruption, but without much change, um, which just leads to a declining public trust in the political process. So, um, so I guess, you know, one thing that I've been cautioning. Um, practitioners nowadays is that that is, that is an, a pretty instructive case for the current movement to advocate for anti-corruption. And the more international initiatives um, that happen to try to put corruption and good governance on the agenda, you know, they should take it into account these historical um, lessons. Um, so uh, let's see, in terms of what kinds of capabilities need to be developed to bring these issues onto the policy agendas and whose capabilities need to be developed, um, I mean, and keep in along the same line of reasoning. You know, I think that it would be important to develop the capabilities um, of external actors to work on um, um, getting reformist elites and reformist activists on the societal side to mobilize um, attention and action simultaneously. And in fact, you know, perhaps setting up the government response first, lining it up first, and then um, and, and then mobilizing action. It's a little bit like capital campaigns in universities, you know, so that, that you raise like 
$800 million, and then you announce the capital campaign. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, I we're like 80% that. of the way there. <laughs> so, you know, just contribute. But that, I mean, but it is a very similar kind of logic. And so, um, you know, I just wanted to briefly go over some of the research that I've been doing in China, um, where it is this um, priming the pump kind of strategy. Um, you know, China, of course, I mean, not to romanticize or glamorize what China is doing because there are lots of potential problems, but um, but when citizens believe that um, higher levels will punish corruption and malfeasance, um, what I find is that there's an associate that's associated with an increase of 13% in citizen participation. It's also increased associated with an increase of more than 25% in the likelihood that they will complain to the government. Um, if their if grassroots elections were canceled, so that's a very high risk kind of engagement, basically. But when they see that higher levels are willing to take action, are willing to enforce, then um, that actually stimulates more citizen action. And so I think that actually is an instructive example. Um, you know, you I, you arguably could see similar things happening in Rwanda. And of course, like I I come from this perspective of focusing on authoritarian regimes in a lot of my research. Um, I'm going to move on. I was going to go over a case um, in, in the Philippines as well, but um, you know, I, I think it would be more important to um, have more of a conversation with the group. Um, so then, what capabilities would we need to develop in students? I mean, again, I think it is this matter of like setting up some of the action and response by the other side or the government side first before mobilizing citizens. Um, and you know, I think there is an increasing amount of research, and maybe you all talk about this at the Kennedy School already. Um, as a political scientist, you know, we're still stuck in this framework where society, the state needs to be insulated from society, that there's this, you know, thinking from Max Weber that um, there should not be personal relationships across the state society boundary. But um, I think there's an increasing amount of empirical research that suggests that, you know, actually building these kinds of personal relationships, even having a revolving door between civil society and the state can be, um, can result in constructive outcomes rather than um, co-optation. So I guess I would raise the possibility that it's important to develop the capability of being multilingual and multicultural in the sense of um, having experience both on the government side and the societal side or the civil society side because I think in order to be able to prime the pump and to line up that government response um, if you're on the societal side you have to be able to translate your goals into the other side's languages um, concerns and values so that's what I would yeah. thank you Rakesh all right so I'm just going to tell two stories and I think lots of the themes that Lily and Alison said, well, well, I think you can use those as lenses. One's a story about primary education in Tanzania, where I, through Traweza, and the other is a story of something I supported through the Ford Foundation of a universal preschool in Cincinnati, Ohio. So, and I think, it's a little bit apples and oranges, but I still think they are insights that are useful. So, you know, education in Tanzania, primary education in Tanzania, like in many other global south countries, I think you know the story, at independence, very few went to school because only the elite were meant to be educated. So in Tanzania, it was less than 10% who come to school. So the story on what you did post-independence was around getting kids into school. And, and that involved a lot of money, so it was all about having enough money. Uh, in 10, 20 years after independence, when so much money was going for debt servicing, the story became, how do we cancel the debt, so reduce the debts so that we have actually enough money for school. And the money was supposed to buy things that mattered, that are needed, like classrooms, desks, books, all these inputs. And, and that captured the public imagination, and there was really a lot of consensus across there. You know, maybe the IMF and the bank at times were outliers, but everybody else, you know, if you talk about um, teachers, kids, parents, local officials, members of parliament, the local governments, businesses, donors, media, Everybody agreed we needed schools and everybody should be in schools. And that's what we spent a lot of energy on. And in doing that, these, this story, this narrative, and these images around what we need is everybody in school, and a good school is one that looks like this. You know, you can, it's easy to visualize what a classroom or a school is, you know, is what we've had for 50 years. And it succeeded, right? You did have debt cancellation. In fact, when I was a student here, right here at the Kennedy School, there was work on the Epic uh, that, that Jeffrey Sachs, one of the few good things he did then was, was, was that. Uh, you know, so there was stuff that it actually succeeded. Uh, you know, we succeeded. Then Tanzania, for example, in the, in the course of a decade while I was working on this, tripled in real terms its budget on education. At that time, it was spending about a quarter of all its, you know, quarter of government budget went to education. 
we did build the classrooms, we did enroll millions of kids. So it actually succeeded. But now the problem is the kids are not learning, and we knew that, but it wasn't catching traction. So what did Prawaisa do, borrowing a model from India? Is we did this simple test that measured actual literacy and numeracy levels. Some of the people supported that. And um, we managed to show at a very large scale through this very simple test that kids, that schooling is not the same as learning. Um, and uh, we showed this data. And the data was, was good, ro simple, but robust. It could be verified. And it, was, it wasn't just proxies. These were real measures of whether kids could write, I mean, read or, or count. It would make a splash when the report was issued. There would be some headlines. But the initial view of the government was to just say, uh, you know, question the methodology, or quest just spurious kind of questioning. But it wasn't taken seriously. The, the, the test was repeated every year, every year. It would make some headlines. Eventually, the government kind of went along. But really, it was only the donors and a few NGOs like ourselves, not even the NGO community, that really bought into this. Even the other NGOs who bought this, this course felt yeah, this matters, but let's also talk about there being enough books and enough desks and, and things of that sort. So, you know, we as Tuaweza did not manage to get a big coalition focused on these things, despite the evidence that pouring more money was not really leading to results. Um, and then there was a key breakthrough, at least we thought it was a breakthrough, uh, where the government was feeling a sense of crisis, and they created something called the big results now, borrowing on a Malaysian model to say, oh, the government is too messy, let's create this kind of vertical high-level unit, and we're going to push through some big results. And we were very proud as Twaweza that we got to influence this. Um, it, the learning outcomes piece was the core focus, there was transparency on the data, there were rewards, the schools that did better, that improved the most, we had rewards, and so forth. Um, huge energy put into this. So you could, I could easily tell you a story now of great success, of uh, because this was official government policy and it was rolled out and so forth. This happened two years be before the previous president, in the last two years of the previous president's term. As soon as his term ended, the current president, even though he comes from the same ruling party, abandoned this entire effort. And the the coalition that had come together to work on the BRN, the Big Results Workshop, was too weak, too fragmented. They had no sense of identity. There's no sense of belonging. There's no sense that we are doing this for this to last. So if you go to Tanzania today, um, it's really not focused on learning outcomes in any serious way. The government is not focused. The community is not focused. Parents, you know, we thought if we give data to parents around their kids are not learning and we gave them ideas of what you could do, that they will get it. Like they have an incentive. It's their own kids. Right? They'll do something. They didn't really do anything. Teachers were felt the feeling they were blamed and so forth. So here's a story of where we, we had some level of elites agreeing. We even had policy pronouncements and so on. But in the end, when all it took was a little nudge from a new regime and the whole thing crumbled mm -hmm. and there really isn't much. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I can tell you other, a story in a different way. There are pieces, but ultimately, there is no coalition focused on this. Now, let me quickly tell you the story of Cincinnati, Ohio. So in November 2016, Trump wins the election. He wins Ohio by 6 uh, or 8 percent. Right? So that, but at, in that same time, the same moment, the voters in Cincinnati passed a new tax for preschool by a margin of 24 percent. So, so hold on. This, these are Trump voters who are also voting for, by a 24% margin, you know, voting for a, a tax to pay for preschool, and essentially preschool for poor kids who happen to be much more lower income and happen to be disproportionately black. So how does, how, what's the story behind? What explains this? So I'm drawing on work by Harry Han, who's a political scientist that Lily and others have worked with. Uh, and so I'll, let me give you a quick background. In 2001, there was a young black man who was uh, killed by the police. There was large civil unrest uh, as a result of that. Uh, remember, Cincinnati has the second highest poverty rate of cities in the US, despite it having lots of Fortune 500 companies. If you do a per capita calculation, Cincinnati has more Fortune 500 companies than Boston, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago. So the business leaders said, gosh, you know, we, but we got to do something. I think a combination of being scared shitless about all the riots and, you know, maybe we have some responsibility. So they came together and, and they 
decided we really need to focus on early childhood. If we focus on early childhood and get to, it'll help, it'll help poor people, it'll get them to do better, maybe they'll riot less and we'll have peace. And they did a campaign, and this involved like, you know, the CEO of Procter and Gamble, lots of big companies. And they did it through the United Way. So the United Way and these big businesses worked, and I'm for time, I'll cut this long story, but they worked from 2003 to 2013. For 10 years, high-level elite engagement in trying to do something in Cincinnati. What did they achieve? In summary, they raised $10 million in 10 years. These are big companies, and they managed to get 5,000 petition, 5,000 signatures to a petition. That's all they were able to do, despite having a consensus at the elite level about trying to do this. And what happened is once the riots died down, and so the commitments were there on paper, but there was no energy behind it to make this move. In the meantime, in 2014, a guy called uh, Troy Jackson became the executive director of a faith-based organization called Amos, one of my favorite prophets, but hey, that's a sidebar. And when he became an executive director, what he did was he went and had 100 meetings with people in his constituency, face-to-face meetings. And when he talked with them about what's going on in some they all talk about, their, a lot of them talk about their children and this issue of preschool education. The same thing that these elites had identified more than 10 years ago came up as the core. So what he did is he said, okay, let's start working on this. But the way I want to work on this, and I'm quoting Hari here, is that I want to do this in a way that builds the interest, capacities, and leaderships of leadership in my constituency. So it's not like I listen and I'm going to figure out the solution for you. He, he proceeded to work in a way that involved his constituents and built their leadership. And he went house to house, engaged over 1,000 people, over um, 60 churches were involved. Um, while this was going on, there's a church in Cincinnati called Crossroads Church. It's an evangelical church, more than 80% white. It's the largest, it's the fastest growing evangelical church in the United States. Its growth rate is, you know, it still is very fast growing. And like I said, mostly white, but not entirely white. And there, remember in 2015, we had all these rash of shootings by police of black men. So there was a pastor, an associate pastor, African-American, who said, we've got to do something here. So what, what, what do I do you know, with a largely evangelical white church? So he um, went to Troy Jackson, the head of uh, Amos, and said, help me out here. I'm, I really need to do something, but I don't know what to do. So they spent seven months. It was a slow process figuring out what to do. And they came up with this idea of undivided, right? Undivided, maybe indivisible, undivided. And uh, they created a six-week program explicitly focused on racial reconciliation inside this large, fastest-growing evangelical church. Over 1,200 members of this church were trained. And they launched a program in 2016 of training this. And from this 1,200 people, 750 volunteers emerged to form what is called the Justice Team. And there was the whole message, talking about your point around action, Lily, was about this is our faith, but how do we put our faith into action? What would it mean to, to do that? And they started being powerful. They had this network. Some of these big leaders who are like, you know, skidding in their tracks heard about this and said, maybe we can get some help from them. So they went to Troy Jackson and said, can you basically get your people to help us behind this preschool initiative? And Troy said, OK, but here's the deal. They have a, I, I forgot to tell you, they come up with a people's platform of four ideas. We, that has to be the starting point. And two, if you want to do this, we have to do this in a way where you actually engage with the constituency. So you, Mr. CEO of Procter & Gamble, and you, of, you, know, you come to our place and you talk, not just to me, but you talk to them. And so they came, you know, literally, in, the, in, these, in these Baptist churches and so on, and started talking and had to listen to these people talk about everyday life and what was going on. And what, what happened is, so for example, the, the People's Platform said, the way we're going to finance this is not a bunch of CSR. We're going to have a progressive income tax. The business leader said, no way. We, you know, business tax, you know, it'll kill business. We don't, no, no progressive income tax. But through this negotiation, you know, and they wanted no tax. They basically settled on a property tax, which was progressive in the sense that, of course, richer people have to pay much more of this. Uh, again, for time, I'll just kind of skip. But basically, this tax got passed. Uh, and not only, not only did that happen, but the elite coalition, the business, agreed to all other aspects of this people's platform that included, for example, a minimum wage of $15 and a number of other progressive, progressive measures. 
So what I want to say in conclusion, what Amos achieved through this approach as the following. One, they won the, they won the battle. They got the tax and they got preschool funded. But the way they did it, and I think this is the key, they conscientized a low-income, marginalized constituency on the issue. They developed positions on the issue. They figured out a pathway to action. They developed the skills to do that. They were able to organize among themselves. They were able to actually also engage with the CEOs. They got to experience that sense of agency. Um, the key word here, I think, is they were not mobilized. They were organized. And we can talk about that distinction, because I think it's useful. Um, this constituency got visibility and recognition. And you, they built a vehicle through this action to create a coalition across black, white, but also across elites and, and uh, low income that came together to win this. So I wonder when I hear this story, and I was, when I was doing work like this at Ford, I was wondering, what if we had done the work on learning outcomes in this sort of way? Would it have made a difference? You know, I don't know, but I wonder. And of course, what this group has succeeded in doing is raising money. And raising money is what we also managed to do in Tanzania for education. Raising money is one thing, improving learning outcomes is another. So I'm curious, will this coalition being in place somehow be better at actually achieving the outcomes or not? These are some of the, the questions we have. And to close with what should students do, I really think the one thing students should do is absolutely personally get engaged in organizing themselves. And they have to, it doesn't matter. I don't care what the issue is, but you do that yourself, and and, I, and uh, that'll teach you, you know, heck of a lot more than just what uh, Matt and others are going to teach. You. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank right. you very much. Before I open it up for questions, I just had a question each for for each of you, Alice. Um, you talked about some things that the students should do is teach them how to work with diversity. Yeah. How exactly does one do that, right? That's your question. I'll ask all of you your questions and then you can answer. Lily, to you, you talked about, you know, you have to mobilize elites. What are some concrete things that one can do, even if you're working on citizen engagement, of, of thinking about how you can mobilize the elites, whether they be political elites or others? What are some concrete things that you can do? Rakesh, you kind of answered the question I had for you. As you were telling the Cincinnati story, which is a fantastic story, at the back of my head was going, what could they have done differently at Tuaweza? And can you just think of some things that you could have to create the vehicle, right? Have these feet on the ground to change people so that had the next president come in and said, I'm putting this off, people would have been on the street saying, no way, you can't touch this. Alex. So two things. One, in my teaching, I try to highlight the benefits of interdisciplinary thinking, like highlighting anthropological and political science insights. Then always my reading lists are diverse to highlight different people's, you know, the benefits of learning from diverse groups. So one is to show that diversity through the classroom tuition. But I think that Rakesh is 100% correct that most of what we learn about the real world comes through our own observations and our own experiences. So to get students engaged in understanding on how to work with diversity, you know, do whatever campaign you like, whether it's a climate change campaign, a sexual harassment campaign, go out and campaign. And in that process, you'll realize you'll achieve a hell of a lot more if you work with a whole bunch of different groups. So just what, what Rakesh says, really. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, I just want to point out that <laughs> when I was asked to be on this panel, and it was just about mobilizing elites, I said no because I, that's not as much, that's not my area of expertise. <laughs> and you've like given me that question. No, so. but you made a really good point when you spoke, right? <laughs> Saying that you do. It's pump, you know, like priming pump, the pump. Priming yeah. the pump. But and they're yeah. on the other side right, that right. you kind of do need to. So, so I, I guess what I would say is that um, when. Um, an external actor or even citizens can reduce the costs of governance to the elite. So you have to think about what the governance outcomes they want are, and sometimes it's tax compliance or um, another kind of compliance. If you can cut a deal, if you could figure out a deal where, um, and so actually, actually, I, I will say a little bit about this um, Philippines civil society organization that we work with. Um, so they, um, they put together a pilot program that would be inserted into the Philippines' conditional cash transfer program, which is one of the biggest in the world. And, um, and what they wanted to do was to train um, people among the poorest of the poor, the, the beneficiaries of the CCT program, um, to pressure local governments for better education and health. And the reason they could do that was because the cash transfer, cash transfer program comes with um, the requirements that 
you have to take your kids to get their vaccinations, and they have to go to primary school in order to get the cash transfer. Um, so it was this nice kind of like piggybacking. Um, so, um, so what they proposed to the government was that what the civil society organization proposed was that you know what we'll help you monitor the conditionalities we'll help you com we'll help you monitor compliance with the conditionalities and in exchange we're going to train these leaders to pressure local officials and so that that was a good enough deal right because there's limited state capacity and if the CSO can offer the government um, a service essentially that they need to accomplish then um, elites could potentially be mobilized yeah, and I really like your comment on the revolving door between civil society and, and government. It's a very nice image to Rakesh. The right wing in this country are masters at that. They do a really great job. Yeah. And that's they are. part of the reason they're yeah. so successful. Um, I, I think um, one, of, one of many um, mistakes I made was um, I just kind of assumed that people would self-organize. Mm. Uh, and you would kind of have this, you know, I had this notion, like, if you look at the... Roman Catholic Church, they have these you know, Bible studies and they organize and their teachers meet and there's a union and yeah, it's weak, but they So there was this notion that people will somehow self-organize. Even though I knew that historically that at independence there, there was ruling party absorbed and co-opted everything, the workers' movement, the women's movement, the youth movement, every movement was co-opted and became part of the party. You were, there were sanctions against independent organizing. So the evidence and the history was very clear. And then unlike India, unlike Latin America, we, we, if you talk to East Africans, there's no real notion of organizing. And yet somehow I thought it'll, it'll kind of happen. And we had, we had no capacity, but neither did we try to, to, to have a theory of organizing. And I think that, that was the biggest, biggest weakness. Uh, the, the other thing I think what put us off is I, again, I take this one, is that I, conf I made a mistake around, I cared about scale. My worry was not creating little boutique mm. projects. Anybody can create a boutique project. Mm. But it was more on, so if you want to have impact at scale, I just was like, how are you going to organize for millions? Mm. I, I don't know how to mm. do that. But that's a mistake. It's not as if you have to have an organizing uh, infrastructure that is huge in order to reach huge numbers of people. You can, if you look, again, if one had studied more, you see that often these movements start with small, very focused ideas and leadership. And so we could have pulled it off if we had just been smart enough and got our act together. May I just say one thing to tie Lily and, yes. and Rakesh's points together? So like Lily was saying, is that people are more likely to mobilize when they perceive the state as responsive, mm -hmm. as tolerant, as capable, and it's nonviolent. So what we've seen from the research on transparencies is no good just providing information about financial flows and expecting people to mobilize in response mm. to poor learning outcomes. They have to believe that the state will do something in response to their organizing. So it's all about publicizing that state responsiveness wherever it's happening. Mm. And through that, you know, hopefully providing credible reasons for hope right. and showing in one district that the state is being responsive and that encouraging more people. So there's this uh, great new book on India highlighting that Gabby Krishna, Krishna which shows that people... Oh, yeah. when a student of mine. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> right, so she's... She, she's I will tell her. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's got this book on, and this world, world politics paper on how rural Indians are more likely to mobilize to push for better services if they've got broader social networks or spatial diversity where they see the state doing that. So when they go and travel and they see the state in action, they're like, ha, huh, I can get that too. I'll push for that back home. Yeah. So it's that small process of generating positive feedback loops, shifting people's expectations about how the state will respond. And that, of course, as more people push for accountability, then we get into the sweet spot of a positive feedback loop. Can I piggyback on and tell yes. just an anecdote? Yes, absolutely. So I did a lot of work around open government and accountability, and there was a time I, was, I had access to President Kikwete around that. And I would, I, when I meet him, I would make a long list of, look, this is not working, this promise is not working, and, and I would give him lots of data around what needed to improve. And he would listen and so on. And after about the third or fourth meeting, he would say, he said, Rakesh, let me tell you a story. <laughs> when I wake up in the morning, and my wife for many years looks at me, you know, she might think I'm now much older, or my face, skin is not as fresh as it used to be, but she doesn't tell me, oh, you don't look as handsome as you used to look. <laughs> she tells me, 
I just love you so much. And then she tells me what she wants. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, so if, even if the government is being non-responsive 99% of the time, if you focus, if I spent my time now, if I could rewind, if I spent my time ki telling Kikweta, this little thing in that part, that was really cool, you know? Yeah. And, and then maybe that would have motivated for those things, rather than the long litany of what was failing. Great. I want to add another anecdote to yours. And this is from Asar, Rukmini yeah. Banerjee, where Uwezo got this idea from. And so they've been doing this like testing on learning outcomes for decades, for a, dec a, a decade. They did this one year where they did a multitude of things. So they did health, they did education, and they did water and sanitation. They actually did water tests, et cetera. So it was like looking at three different sectors. And then they collected this data and then talked to the district officials. And what they found, and Rukmini told me this herself, it was a game changer in the reaction they got from the government officials at the, at the district level. Because they said, now you're telling me a story about things I care about, what is my quality, and we can have a conversation about maybe thinking about what I can do about this. Because when you come in and you tell me that the children aren't learning at the, you know, they can't do fourth, at fourth grade, they can't even do first grade level math, then that, I know this. Don't tell me something I don't know. Come to me and tell me what I can do about it. And so I think that is really important, right? A lot of these people, they don't have the rose-colored lenses. They know things aren't working. Mm -hmm. But what they would really like is a how-to. You know, maybe you could try this, maybe this. Just pointing fingers at them, telling them that you're doing a crap job mm -hmm. isn't really helpful to anybody. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree. With that, I'm going to open to questions. We'll take three questions, and then just uh, uh, tell us who you are and where you're from and who the question's for. Thank you. Not everyone at the same time. <laughs> Dan. Okay, this is actually a comment, and I hate being the guy who does that. Uh, but I worked with Matt in Sri Lanka, and one of the first things we did when we were there is he had um, Kennedy School student interns look for positive deviance, look for parts of the government that were actually functioning very well. And I didn't think too much of it, but you know, I read the cases, and I thought they were interesting. And then it was incredibly useful because whenever anyone I met with said, stop expecting so much of us, you know, mm. we can't mm. get anything done here, it's always the same, mm. I would say, well, I've heard the passport office is really good. I hear people <laughs> <laughs> get a passport in like one hour. <laughs> you know, even in the States, it takes like two days. Okay. And they were like, oh, yeah, that's true. And mm -hmm. not only that, but you could point to the whole story of how that happened, the, the change process. And it wasn't, you know, outsiders coming in. It was completely local. So it was incredibly useful, and I'd love to have more stories like that mm -hmm. that I could learn from. Mm -hmm. That's your hope thing again. Yeah. <laughs> I'll share a hope story. Great. <laughs> a few years ago, I was involved in doing a big study of service delivery in the Middle East as a region. And um, the standard way in which that would be done would be just to do a whole bunch of different country cases, little bar graphs showing Egypt's here, Lebanon's there, and everything. Everybody thinks so, and that's really interesting. But we said, no, this one we're just going to say, look, most of the lessons about what people really need to learn are domestic, probably, rather than international. And maybe we can tell some positive deviance, not just stories, but actually use the existing data we have to be able to explain, to both document standard deviation <laughs> as an empirical matter, but then also to explain why, you, where, and how you got this diversity and use that as the basis for plugging into a domestic conversation. And we, and we did this report, and it was all very nice. And then we, um, <laughs> my co-author and I got summoned by the uh, Saudi executive director of the World Bank. And we thought, this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> you only get summoned by the Saudi executive director when he's really pissed about something. And, uh, so we sort of braced ourselves before we walked into the room. And, um, and he said, you know, I've read a lot of these regional reports, and they're always just, this country should learn from this country, this rigorous evidence, blah, blah, blah. And he said, you know, that's the first report I've ever read that really taught me something, not so much I didn't know, but helped to, to give a language to explaining why there was such diversity. And I said, I really, really liked that sort of approach. I just wanted you to know about it. <sighs> survive. But it, was, but it was really, I think, telling that so there's, there's all sorts of, you have a positive deviance discussion in academia, it's all about selecting on the dependent variable, all these sort of nerdy kind of discussions about whether it's the right way to do things. And those are legit discussions, you should have them at Harvard and MIT. Um, 
but geez, when you're doing this stuff, as, as Rakesh was saying, in the, in the political space, you just you can't just be the purveyor of, of what appears to be an empirical reality of most things aren't working. Something is working somewhere some of the time. Where is it? How is it happening? And in this case, in the Middle East, where we're doing it, the, the methodological virtue was that you could control for uh, policy consistency because these are relentlessly centralized countries, so the policy is pretty much identical at least at the country level. Um, so when you see this big variation, it can't be because there's a policy issue. There's, mm. a, there's a largely an implementation issue or an implementation meets context issue. And helping to illuminate all of that and provide hope and provide a basis in these really tough circumstances, like in Palestine, where it just, it's grim, really, really tough to do work there. And you find a school in your data set that happens to be producing kids that get outcome performance tests in uh, schooling that are OECD standard by average levels, not spectacular, but you know, when a school can do that in the middle of nowhere, uh, where 70% of the fathers are dead or in jail because of the circumstances they're under, and yet their kids are aspiring to these amazing uh, things in the future, and you do, do some deep drilling to find and talk about that sort of stuff, you, you give a World Bank country director, you give local politicians so much more uh, actual material to work with and, uh, and there's a bias for hope to use uh, then uh, Hirschmanian kind of language to, to be able to unpack a lot of that. So I think that for us as in a, in a place like Harvard, it, it, it pays to be methodologically astute with sort of what, what are the trade-offs, so to speak, that you take when you engage in doing this ton of uh, positive deviance kind of work. But the uh, unappreciated component on the plus side is just how it works and, and feeds into a political logic of, of how change actually happens. And I think that's underappreciated. Maybe hopefully the place of the Kennedy School, it's that, that trade-off is weighted a little bit more differently than it might be if you're trying to get published in the American Political Science Review or something. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Hi, Alicia Hiley. I'm a postdoc here. I have a question that I don't think is fully formed, mostly for Lily, but anyone is welcome to take the bait. I was really interested by this idea of priming the pump and not sort of activating your sort of broad-based human coalition until you have the leads in line. But I see that as really kind of a two-actor model. You have some sort of probably government elite and some sort of group of people that would like something, and hopefully their interests can be aligned if they sort of all get on the same page. But what happens when you have like a third actor? I work in global food systems. Oftentimes the private sector is highly reticent or even working really hard behind the scenes. Or if you take climate change as another example, to come online. So then do you still have the same advice that you can't like activate citizen engagement? I guess that's what 350.org has done. But what happens? What do you even do at that point if elites are not ready to go where you need them to go and yet what you're saying is that you can't activate citizens or they're just going to get kind of ignored and I don't know. So that's my question, not very well formed. Yeah. I mean, no, I, that's a really good question. I mean, I think if you have a three-actor model, and I think of um, there's someone at, who was at MIT who's now at Oxford, I think, who was working on this three-actor model of like mining companies, Matt indigenous Amengel. communities. Yeah, Matt. Um, um, mining companies, indigenous communities, and the government, right? So when you have a three-actor model, it then it's a different game. Um, and um, it is a matter of assessing, like, can you get two sides to Put pressure on the third, right? And so it's less this like um, line up the government, um, maybe line up the citizenry, and then and then get them to be, and then get them to go public and coordinate. Um, because I think with three, you can like pressure the third. There was someone behind. Yeah. Hi, I'm from India. My name is Kitty. I'm in mid career here at Kennedy School, and um, I'm wondering if you have uh, examples of um, the elite in particular working to um, reduce the polarization that society sees today. I mean, increasingly our country's citizenry is becoming increasingly polarized. And uh, more and more authoritarian regimes are democratically elected. Uh, so it's a cause of concern. And uh, I mean, people believe in what the leader stands up for. Uh, so that's a strangely difficult situation. I mean, the, how people understand democracy is, is very complex. And uh, as a student of democracy, it, it sort of appalls me <laughs> and so on. 
let's take two others and then you can all answer that, Matt and Varya. Um, I had uh, a, a, a couple of questions. One is to all of you and then the next is to Rakesh. I'll start with Rakesh. You said you would clarify the difference between organizing and mobilizing and why organizing matters more. I'm really fascinated. Mm -hmm. To um, Alice and Lily, one of the things that all three of you said, which is really interesting about both how we should teach students and about what works, is that you need actors to be engaging with each other and moving around. Mm. And you need to be moving people into different realities, mm. and very much in Rakesh's story, but I think also very much in Alice's story. And it sounds like in Lily's story too, that it's almost taking people outside of their tribal identity so that they can explore other people. Mm. At the same time, Lily made the comment that mobilizing attention and mobilizing action are different and that mobilizing action almost requires it sounded like appealing to them in their tribe mm. like appealing to them in their party in so there's something about this static identity that matters to mobilize their action but it uh, sounds like it's something like their dynamic movement that mobilizes their attention and I don't know if I'm just hearing wrong but it's a tension that I would just be interested to kind of hear about is how do you how do you speak to people where they are, but how do you simultaneously get them to uh, to move around and engage with different people? Um, I, yeah, my comment or my question is actually very linked to what Matt just said about the difference between mobilizing and organizing. And I just wonder whether there's a time component there. Like we tend to think about mobilizing as a one-off around elections or campaigns or something versus something that is a lot more sustained. Mm -hmm. So you think about the relationship. You, you're trying to change your, the way that people relate to the government over time. So is there evidence, is there learning, is there stuff around that, um, that component and linked to that, is there a mobilizing within the state as well? I mean, is there kind of studies or evidence about how you mobilize within government actors in order to Great. Thank you. Anyone want to go first? Um, okay. Um, so organizing, mobilizing. Um, so one feature, I think, is that Mobilizing tends to be instrumental. You know, you mobilize for pur purpose. Uh, it's typically you figured out what it is you want, and then you just need the numbers of the masses of the elites or whoever it is to behind it. So it's in effect you say, "I figured it out. Come support my thing." Um, you try. It's more efficient. You know, you you not at some level you don't care about the you don't even care about the identity or the capacity or perhaps even anything else about that constituency that you're mobilizing. You just need them to vote or you just need them to demonstrate yourself. Um, and ultimately, it's it's transactional, right? It's done with. Whereas organizing is much more interested in the capacity of that constituency itself to advance its own interests. Uh, so that means you have to get to know them, you have to build relationships. Um, and it's not as simple as, well, they know best. They know a heck of a lot, but, but there's a whole bunch of things they don't know. They don't know how to organize, they may not know how to analyze, there may be differences, there may be a complete lack of hope. So it, it takes, it's hard work, it, it has lots of setbacks, it takes a long time. And a lot of that is about building hope, but also building trust, right? Why? People are making very rational choices, like Lily was saying, of not investing in doing anything because they have lots of experience that tells them it's not worth it. You know, the government won't respond or whatever. So to be able to to work at it and find a at least a partially viable pathway that you can work on, manage expectations, all of those things, it's a very, very long slog and hard work. And um, and it, yeah, it, it's not easy to easy to do. On the, on the, I just want to make a quick comment, Matt, on your question also about identity. Um, I, I think the mistake we make is to think that you are either a tribalist or you have, you know, you're a cosmopolitan. <laughs> um, you know, and or like, you know, this multi, like, I think, I think the basis of any organizing uh, is based on tribes. Now, your tribe might be particularly interesting. Uh, but it is, it's, it's, it's more around the affiliations you feel with other tribes and how you find that there's something in common between my tribe and your tribe and your tribe, rather than some kind of dilution of our tribe that we kind of post-tribe, um, <laughs> I think is the, is the key. And a lot of the time, and again, in this country, I think one side is much better at understanding that than the other side. You could even argue, 
ironically, that one of Obama's biggest failures is he tried to kind of point to a post, post-tribal post America. We are not red, we are not blue, we are not white, we are just American. Well, there's, there's no such thing as America if you're not also at the same time all these other things. So. <laughs> Right. Um, to respond to Matt's point about identities and diversities, I think, as Lily was saying earlier, identities are salient, and when they're triggered, you can push people in various ways. So, for example, when Trump says trade is bad, we see a big shift in what Republicans think. Um, as opposed to so what, the le what the leader says, that can push people who identify within that cohort. But at the same time, we can mobilize even greater change through broader, more inclusive coalitions. So to give an example from Bolivia, Morales was an indigenous leader, but he didn't just market himself as indigenous, he marketed himself as anti-austerity. And through that, he was able to galvanize a broader alliance. So yes, identities are salient. Yes, you can pick people up in you know, selling yourself as being one of that group, but you can achieve something even bigger if you can reach out through more inclusive language. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I've got anything else to add to those very good responses. Um, I mean, I guess I would just tie this polarization question together with what Matt raised, um, which is to say, um, I mean, I think that you have to use what you what you got, basically. Like, and if you have a tribe, like that tribe has an organization and an identity, and those are really valuable resources. So, like, you should organize through that. But mm. I think, and this is picking up on this point about polarization. Um, and you know, Rakesh has heard me say this before, that um, what ideally happens is that the leaders of those tribes are able to come to an agreement about um, the rules that will govern the process um, of interaction amongst tribes, right? And that those rules ought to be like rules of civilized dialogue and <laughs> rules of civilized negotiation. Um, and that is also, the fact that you have tribes with leaders, that's a resource, and so like we ought to try to make use of those resources in those ways. Just one footnote, Salima, to Preeti. Yeah. Um, so I don't have the answer, but there's a guy called Salil Chetty that you might know. Um, you know he's here. So he's asking the very same question that yeah. you are, and I think that you should talk, but you probably already are. <laughs> Any other questions? I have kind of a weird question. Um, when you're talking about you know elites and, and having a plan for them, how, I think, how much of it is a model where they want the opposite of what you want, and it's, you know, the world is, what's the word, um, win, win, lose, that if, if your cause gains, their cause loses. Zero something. Zero something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, versus, um, how often do you think it's just they don't quite understand what you're saying, or maybe there's a way that everyone can win, and it's just a matter of getting them to see the right way, or, or making an arrangement where everyone benefits. Uh, just in your personal experience, or in your studies in general, which, which is true more often. May I give an example from Latin America? So, sure. over the 2000s, income inequality fell in many Latin American countries, especially those that experienced a commodity boom. And how that happened is largely through sharing the proceeds of growth. So rather than tackling the structural causes of inequality, rather than by redistributing land, which is phenomenally unequal, or pushing for more progressive taxation, it was a win-win coalition of you know, minimum wage hikes enabled by the commodity boom and growth. So there they were able to achieve some wins for all as long as it was win-wins. But the problem is that many of these Latin American governments didn't tackle these structural causes of inequality, and that formed despondency and frustration with the PT and many other parties. So you, know, you tackle some bits that you can, you get some benefits, you, don't, you miss out on the other bits, you gain the support of the elites, but they may not be long-lasting, etc. Sorry, that's a rubbish answer, but I mean that it, it, there, 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 are, there are bits that are good, there are bits that are bad, and there are all these sorts of trade-offs and complications depending on what decisions are taken. Great. Any other comments? No? Okay. I have, I have one other question. It's, uh, it's, um, it's a bit of an existential question of teaching, and it's about the last question you had about what we teach our students. I would say that, you know, in, in, so in, 
August, uh, Frank Fukuyama wrote this, this article that said public policy schools teach people about, I mean, as I put it, about answers rather than about how to do things. Mm. I think it's worse than that because I think it's that what you guys have said really matters is, is, is a lot of kind of how to know yourself, how to know your tribe, how to build relationships with other tribes, how to move in and out, how to compromise, mm. how, to, how to agree on second best solutions mm. at times. Mm. I think it's not that we, only, we just teach answers, we teach that answers are needed. Mm. And we teach that the identity of people working in public policy is about your expertise and your answer mm. and not about these other things. Um, I just wanted to get your sense of, you know, am, I, am I right about this and what do we do about it if I'm right about that? How do we steer, because I, we want to keep teaching people how to analyze data. Mm. We want to teach, keep, you want all that stuff mm. we want people to learn mm. But we want them to learn that stuff with some humility yeah. and with some context mm. and with some mm. idea that this is a tool that you use in the process of mm. engaging. This isn't mm. the end in mm. itself. I just kind of wondered if there was any reaction and if you had any idea of kind of how do we, how do we kind of thread that needle of saying this stuff all matters, this stuff is important, but let's put it into its place and let's kind of show you how to use it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great comment. It makes me think of this op-ed in the New York Times that was written by a climate scientist in North Carolina. Did anybody read this? Where, um, you know, he, he wrote about how um, he would visit the local government office, and the local official that he visited would be like, "You're an interest group. <laughs> like, you know, you like I don't care one one bit about your scientific expertise. Like, you're an interest group and." And he talked about how like, um, it wasn't until he re visited repeatedly and built a relationship of trust and mutual respect that um, it's, you know, it's, it's, I think, very similar to what you're saying. Like you, you, you can, it's important to know the policy and maybe the best practice or whatever, um, but um, ultimately it's, uh, you, have to, you have to persuade people based on interactions of mutual respect. Mm -hmm. like, even if they don't believe, even if they believe you're like a storyteller, basically, like, so, um, so again, it comes back to this process um, norm, like, what are the no norms that govern the process of interaction? Yeah. I would like that introduction for all my speeches, nice little <laughs> jingle. Um, I, I, just a, a segue, I was speaking to someone recently who was an RA for an IPA project, mm -hmm. and this person was not, she didn't have a glittering career, but she was good at talking to people and, and rapport. And they previously had a Harvard, very qualified, very brilliant young mind who, was a, who they called a Harvard brat. And she was, you know, academically brilliant, superb. You know, she knew how to run a regression, but she wasn't good at working for this IPA project. So they had to replace her with someone else who was a nice, decent human being who knew how to engage with people. Um, so yeah, ab absolutely, I'm totally with you. You know, to, to get things going, we need to be nice, decent human beings. So that is something partly that we need to teach and inspire. You know, for me, in, you know, one thing I've really benefited from, and I, maybe even more so than any sort of academic content, is seeing how my professors interacted and engaged with others and provided mentoring and provided constructive criticism and just seeing how they engaged with others. You know, those role models to me were so important. You know, so when I see how people respond to questions or how people engage with me. So I think that role modeling process and how we engage with our students is phenomenally important so they don't end up with being Harvard brats. Uh, you know, that goes for any place. <laughs> Secondly, um, I think it's the process of continual critique and being aware of alternatives and questioning what we're doing. One phrase that I like to tell my students is, always embrace self-critique but never self-doubt. You know, always listen to alternatives and think about other ways of doing things, but never doubt that you can do it. So believe in yourself but be open to all the other criticisms of what you're doing. And that's, that's I mean, your point about issuing hubris. So I think that's so important, to cultivate that awareness of alternative hypotheses, alternative disciplines, alternative ways of doing things, but to have that sense of self-belief. 
Rakesh. I think that's really cool. Um, so three things. When I was a grad student here, um, I was also uh, very excited and very motivated to do a small project. I won't get into the details of that with um, homeless uh, guys, men in in Boston, in the south end of Boston. And um, I, it was the hardest thing. It mostly didn't work, and ultimately. You know, even though I had lots of ideas and lots of skills and lots of things going for me, it didn't work. And that, so in, in the, you know, I'm doing that, and in the mean that I'm taking courses here around designing policies and so on. And so it was, it was a kind of nice, you know, reality check. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another reason why it's good for people to get engaged in real world stuff uh, while they are in school. Somehow, somehow mm -hmm. try to integrate mm -hmm. the two. That's one. Um, second, gosh, right. I've written this out. Um, uh, where was I going? This uh, little, it's disappeared, so then I'll let it go. Maybe it comes back out suddenly. Yay! Put my, uh, put my hand up. Oh, let me, yeah. Um, <laughs> see? Oh, that was fast. <laughs> it was going to move on, and you're like, no, yeah. I got it. Um, I, uh, I teach a few classes, not a whole course. I teach a few classes at, uh, at Columbia, at the School of Public, International Public Affairs, where all I talked about is things I've done where they were, you know, they were not stupid. They were smart. They were well intended, usually well executed. Like, it's, a st it's, not, a, it's not a car, it's not a a cardboard story of a, a badly done project. It's a story of well-meaning, well-motivated people trying to do good things and ultimately not succeeding. And because they are stories about myself, there's a certain intimacy and a certain kind of responsibility there to that. And, and um, the, the student feedback that comes either right in that class, after those classes, or in, at the end of the course, they often point to that particular device being really helpful to them, rather than kind of giving answers. Tell actually stories of when you intend to do well, but not. And I think that that's something that could be really, really helpful to do. A final point I want to have is around design of policy matters. Um, this is, I mean, a little bit like Andrea Campbell's point on feedback loops, maybe, uh, I think connects with this. but. Oh, you know, a lot of the time we think that we focus a lot on just what is a good policy and, you know, what's the incidence analysis and who will benefit, all those really useful things. But we rarely talk about how can you design a policy that builds in hooks where constituencies will continue to be engaged, right? So how do you design a policy, for instance, which will require in its very structure for there to be annual reporting, will require feedback loops, where in fact it will keep fueling, creating and fueling a constituency that has a stake in that policy and will be able to defend it, or keep it real, or hold it accountable. Uh, and I, I don't have the evidence, you know, I don't have research uh, on this, but my hunch is that that's, that design matters because ultimately the policy will go where the center of gravity of that country goes. Uh, and even a good policy will kind of wither away and you'll have a lot of isomorphic mimicry unless there's a constituent sense. So you can, you can, it doesn't just accidentally happen, you can design policies to be of that sort. And that's one thing that I think you can teach students. On your point on telling stories, I, I really like that and I personally am very moved when I hear someone telling their story because again, it's this like observation, it's kind of an extension of an observation. How do you compare that to cases? Because you know, a lot of people use cases I have my own bias on cases, but I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that case that's being taught in a class versus your personal experience, where you are the one telling the story through your experience and can answer any question that anyone asks to the best of your ability. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't thought. I mean, I, I think I like cases. The problem with cases is that uh, that they can often become kind of performances, right? You, you become this, you take, you pull out these stylized elements yep. of a case. So, and you often strip away the, the ambiguity and the really interesting parts. So that's, they can, can come across as camp. But I still think cases compared to lots of uh, jargon mm -hmm. is always better. But I Did also think, I mean, I, I just want to underscore another aspect of what Rakesh is saying, which is that 
These are stories, if, I'm, if I heard you right, about like failure, mm -hmm. right? Which I think is another incredibly important thing to teach students. Absolutely. That, like, um, you know, to give stories about failure and learning from failure, but also to inculcate the fact that like that should be totally upfront and mm. normalized. And we, we still do a terrible, terrible job of that, like I think in every dimension. Mm. And, and I think the stories of failure become, they're really interesting when they're not stupid failure, right? Because a lot of stories of failure are like, exactly. look, they didn't think of this mm. obvious thing, or they were just all misogynist. So you know, like, those are easy to mm. write off, or you write them off because you, you never identify with them. You would say, I would never do that. Mm. But the ones where you can identify with, like, I could have actually done mm. uh, are the ones, I think, that are more captivating. Yeah. Great. Michael, you had it. Yeah, it's a question for you, actually. Just, uh, could you just uh, riff a little bit more on this, um, uh, the virtues of targeting elites, so to speak? Because I think that's somewhat a relative question. Everyone in this room, by any worldly standard, mm. is a super elite. Mm. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, was what you were saying sort of uh, authorizers, like people who have political authority, that can be from presidents down to local council people, down to the chair of the... Uh, School board. I mean, this this is elites at multiple levels. So, in the Russian doll sense of there's you know different layers of, of, of elite ness, so to speak. Um, when uh, I don't know, just just speak a little bit more to that. I think because I think I, I've always thought that we I, I understood the ethics of what you were saying about the um, that you don't want to be in a situation where one is acting an extra jurisdictional space, so to speak, to try and leverage and influence something that's not your purview to, to engage with. But I think a large part of our theory of change with the, the Building State Capability Program is that, yeah, we need to have these exec, exec ed programs to sort of get the apex of the triangle, so to speak, but uh, we give our training away, we give our book away precisely because we don't, our theory of change is about sort of the middle of the pyramid as much as anything else, because those are the people that actually do a lot of the work that we really care about. So. Um, I'm sympathetic in principle to what you're saying, but just can you just sort of riff a little more on sort of what you what what's your theory of eliteness, so to speak, that, mm -hmm. that we need to worry about. Yeah, I mean, I guess there are two things that occurred to me if I were to riff on it. Is I mean, I, I guess first I, I'll say I was thinking about government decision makers when I said okay. elites, um, so I had a, a pretty specific <clears throat> idea in mind, um, which I didn't make explicit. Um, but um, but now that you bring it up and you tie it to this point of like not mobilizing citizens or ordinary people until you mobilize elites, I'm realizing that actually I think there's an important um, point about accountability that um, to take it a little bit further, I, I think that you know we should think twice before mobilizing citizens when we as elites or an external actor or an international organization or some sort of international advocacy campaign, if, if those, if we, if the external actors cannot be held accountable by the people we are seeking to mobilize, mm. that doesn't seem right, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And so, and I think that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I was thinking of the specifically about government decision makers, and I think that in the building state capacity program, um, you know, I think those mid-level bureaucrats, the implementers, are an incredibly important actor, and they're they're um, they're both principals and agents, and right. that's what that's the interesting <laughs> bit, right? Yeah. Um, um, so, um, I mean, I could riff more on that, but um, but yes, I mean, I think broadly speaking, um, important to mobilize those people when their principles are imp important to mobilize principles, but the principles ought to be, I mean, not the principles, the um, I mean, they should be agents, but and so so actually, it should be that the Ordinary people can be enabled as principals to hold the, those those people's agents accountable. Yeah. So we could build out our three-person model and sort of lateralize it and sort of yeah, say yeah, yeah, right. when principals become agents and when agents become principals. I mean that, that's right. Like, I mean you have to like yeah, like well you have We're to keep switching, but yeah, yeah. yeah, that's good. Thanks. Salima, can I ask Lily a question? You can so, absolutely. So this mobilizing elites thing, uh, how? So my experience of government decision makers is. You know, you rarely find the real, the kind of completely callous person, and you rarely find the completely amazing motivated reformer. They're kind of in between, and most of the time, they they don't act, take much initiative because that's what usually gets into trouble. So they kind of, mm. so in the in the theory of mobilizing elites, two questions: like how do you nudge them to their kind of better selves, <laughs> right? And and who does that, right? And and 
you know, do you think that that can be kind of a bunch of technocrats or people like ourselves or, I don't know, um, the World Bank person? Or do you think that there is something around, something powerful or maybe enduring if that is done by cons the constituency who most feels the pain of, you know, the lack of action on their part or the inattention on their part? Is there, is there something around of value, both in terms of achieving the outcome, but also having that outcome last, you know, that pressure last, if it comes from the constituency. So two questions. How do you nudge them, and who, do, who does that? Yeah, I mean, on how you nudge them, I have a two-by-two. Two. <laughs> 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 Typology of intrinsic and extrinsic benefit. <laughs> so like, I'll send that slide to you. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as many of you know, and I'm sure, like, know the research, there's, like, intrinsic and like, extrinsic motivation. And moreover, if you motivate them by um, creating or creating external incentives, there's motivational crowding, which crowds out, like, any kind of intrinsic motivation that they have, right? So you have to be really very careful about um, whether you're using external um, punishment and incentives. Um, so that like the good types, the people who like are genuinely motivated, don't like switch into this different game, right? So, I mean, I can elaborate on that, but I'm assuming all of you know sort of that literature, um, right? Like there's this there's really daycare center um, paper that I always raise, right? Like you penalize teach or you penalize parents for picking up your kids late, and all of a sudden they all start picking up their kids late because they're like, oh, this is a fee for service model now. Um, instead of like, oh, I feel really bad about keeping my kid's teacher um, late, et cetera. Um, so, so yes, I mean, I think that's important to know. And then who nudges, or how, t uh, this, uh, the importance of the disempowered um, pressuring or nudging, um, I mean, I think it comes back to what you were saying. And I, I also have a couple of examples or papers that I've written on this where there's something incredibly, there is something incredibly powerful if you are able to get the elites to come to the, to like level, to re-level, to, um, you know, like a, mm -hmm. if they come to the, the ordinary people or, um, you know, I wrote a paper where um, local officials in China um, were able to increase citizen compliance because they ceded decision-making control over financial resources to village council or villager councils. And that was an, a really important symbolic, like priming the pump kind of like trust um, or, um, what's called brave reciprocity in game theory, right? Like, so the, in that case, the officials were like, um, you know, we don't know if you're gonna reciprocate by like giving us more compliance, but we're gonna cede control. And, and if you reciprocate, then you'll start this like um, positive equilibrium going. Um, so, yes. Matt, I wonder if you wanted to answer that question. Yeah, I mean, also. <laughs> Um, Sorry to throw you on the spot, but no, no, I'm just I'm just thinking about it because I think in our work motivation is the hardest thing. Exactly. Uh, and the motivation of the author, you know, we we don't speak about elites because everyone is an elite, but we speak about the authorizers and then we speak about the work piece. Um, okay. and, you know, and uh, it, it, motivating people is very, very, very difficult. I mean, Tim and Dan have both been involved, and in I think we would say. Uh, agree completely with Lily that you need to be very careful about how you use extrinsic motivators because I think that they do crowd out other motivators very, very quickly. Um, and uh, I think uh, the, the intrinsic motivators though are hard to find when you're an outsider. It's hard to understand what it is that's going to move people, that's going to drive people. And I almost feel that we, we, we depend on luck when we're working in these places it, to, it, it, in, it, 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 and, and, and where we're lucky enough to, to, to kind of trip over a thing that mobilizes some of the people we're working with and then that becomes like a mobilizer for other people as well because that person then starts to mobilize people because I, I do believe one of the things that's interesting is when you, when you nudge one person there's an impact on other people, right? And one of the things you guys are talking about is, you know, it's, this isn't about citizens versus the state. It's about that. It's about a dance, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I, where I would see bureaucratic reform as well, I think it's the same. You know, we often think it's like people, public officials are in tension with politicians above them, and it's like this constant battle that they're in. And I think, no, it's more like a kind of an interactive movement. Um, and so if you can kind of identify and, and often through like some kind of intrinsic motivator from someone 
then that person can become like a little bit of an intrinsic motivator for others. So it's kind of an interesting thing about who. So I would say it, how, I think the nudges need to be intrinsic more than extrinsic. That's, that's and, and we, we've kind of found that. I don't know what, you know, some of my colleagues are with me here. Um, that, that, that said, I think that getting people in the room sometimes requires some extrinsic motivators. Mm -hmm. Getting people on board at the beginning is to kind of give them a, an external nudge, so to speak, which I think Alice's story also from the earlier is about kind of the extrinsic motivators at a global level. I think they've had it at a, look, at a, at a personal level mm -hmm. too. But I think that when you speak about who does the nudge, you know, we're designing our, we're kind of, we're, we have a role in designing the intervention, right? It's not our intervention, but we design the choreography of the intervention to a degree. So we, we are looking for ways in which how do we, how do we become maybe the first nudges, right? Knowing though that our nudge is not going to be enough to, to keep them going very long. But because we're iterating a lot, we are really, really trying that early on in the process, we are doing the nudging, we are convening the folks, we are holding them together, but we're really looking for the person who emerges as the intrinsic motivator of everybody else. And you're almost looking then to create a bunch of nudges that happen between the people themselves and to almost create like a, I don't know, a, an interactive nudging <laughs> like setting up a snowball, right? Think, setting up a snowball. That's exactly yeah. what it is. I think that that's, and, and, and I think that that's what you're after. And I think that when you're thinking about motivation in groups, that is what happens. And mm -hmm. if you can get the group, the individuals in the group, to start mobilizing each other, I think it's really powerful. It's one of the reasons also why when we work, we, we try to always work with multiple teams mm -hmm. rather than one team. Because... We find that you know different teams can be kind of like at different points of their you know emotional roller coaster, and if some of them are mobilized and motivated because they had a good week or something happened or they had a conversation or something that really put them on a high, they can kind of bring the others up. Um, but it is, I think, a very very uh, mysterious thing. I think. I mean, there's a big literature on it, and the literature is fantastic and very useful to a point. Um, so, but I think, yeah, to me, intrinsic, very important. You do need some intrinsic motivators, but you need to be careful to use them very sparingly. And I would say you use them sparingly at key points, mm. the beginning of the work, mm. and then maybe at points when you're looking for some kind of tipping, mm. you know, mm. when, when, when it's almost like people are moving to that place where they, they need something to kind of push them into a totally new level of work. Um, but the key thing is to try and get that kind of like, I'm almost thinking it's like, what's that game, pinball, right? It's like the lights keep banging yeah. because the ball keeps bouncing around. And it's, it's, if you can get that going, then the thing works as pinball. And if you can't get that going in our teams, then the teams kind of die. They, they, they just don't continue. So, But it's a big, big deal. It's very hard to do. Great, thank you. Do you guys have any last comments? Anyone? Well, thank you very much. It's been an honor to be on a panel with the three of you. I have to say personally, I am so inspired and in awe of all of the work that you guys do and what I love the most about, and it's true, what I love the most is how humble each of you are, you know, the, for the amount of incredible work that you have all done in your lives and you, you're on the ground, you engage with real things, you care about them, and yet, you know, you don't have any egos, you don't have any Kind of, um, you, have you seen where we're sitting? <laughs> I have good comparisons for my comment. So it has really been an honor. I have learned a lot, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.